give it a couple more minutes, see if anyone turns up. So today's lecture will be on system integration, um, which is pretty essential for many different topics for electronics engineers. And I don't think it's taught, there's no particular unit that really focuses on it, so we're just having this one lecture to cover some of those basics. Um, but we'll start with um, just getting a little bit of feedback from you guys on the, um, firstly with the remote lab. So we have a couple of questions. If you can go to the poll site when you're ready and just let us know your thoughts on that. So we're just starting by gathering a quick bit of feedback. If you guys can log on and let us know your thoughts. So as you all know, the remote lab is a brand new idea we're trying out. So this is going to be really useful, as well as the survey results at the end of the worksheet. Um, of course, there's going to be some downsides to it. The upsides are that we give you that full flexibility of how to use your time. Um, and it's a good use of resources, financially at least. But if the downsides outweigh the pros, then we won't be doing it anymore. Just gathering some quick feedback on the remote lab. You can with the VPN? What's wrong with it? Okay. Well, we can check at the end of the lecture if you want. But so you have the separate knobs for frequency and amplitude? Yeah. And you're saying the amplitude one doesn't work all the time? Yeah, when you turn okay. the changing the amplitude, yeah. uh, it does not work. Okay, all right. So we'll check into that. There might be delays if there's several people on it. It might cause some bugs. Um, but if you can, so there's a survey at the end of the worksheet where you can also add some comments. If you can put that sort of stuff in or if you email it to us if it needs addressing quickly, we'll look into that. And as you know, you should all be coming to the end of the remote lab, so I hope you've all actually logged in at this point. Um, we also, Dinesh asked to find out how many of you have completed the feedback survey, or how many of, of this class, so if you can vote on that.
Okay, so no one's done it yet out of this group. I know some people have. We can obviously see the responses online as well, but it's interesting to see in terms of who's turning up to the lecture and how people are managing their time. But please do make the time to do it. I think it will take five minutes when you do the survey, and it's going to be really handy for us to work out if it's worth doing this again next year, if we should expand on it, minimize on it, that sort of stuff. Um, so I have one last feedback poll today, and that is a poll about the polls. So do you find these polls useful? Obviously, it's may maybe not so useful, the ones I'm asking right now, but obviously you've seen we use them in the lectures um, to ask you questions and get feedback. I'll just give people a minute to vote on that. And then we'll get into the report feedback. Okay, so today's lecture, the topic's going to be system integration. It's going to be quite, um, we're just going to cover it quite high level, like just the key concepts. It's not going to be very technical because um, you're not going to be uh, really assessed on this topic, but it's stuff that you need to know. And especially when you're in the lab, you might come across these problems. It might even give you some insights you could add to your report. And it might help you to, um, it might help you in some of the exam questions, but you won't be directly asked much on this actual topic, just so you know. Um, so yeah, we'll just be covering them all at the kind of surface level today. But before that, I want to give some feedback on the reports. So I've marked probably 90% of them working for the last ones. Hopefully post them this evening or tomorrow latest, and then you'll get your marks and your individual feedback. So that's going to be in turn it in. You can see the, uh, the feedback comments. Be, some people have comments on the actual PDF, where I've just pointed out maybe a typo or incorrect little parts, but most of the comments are in the, in the text. You should be able to access on the right side. So you'll have maybe four or five comments. Um, please don't get down, because I know the feedback's often negative, because um, if it's all great, there's not much to talk about. I can just say great. But if there's things wrong, that's when I'm going to write more comments. So don't let it put you down. I know it's going to come across a bit negative for some of you, but we're just trying to help you learn and improve for the next time. Not just for this unit, but any time you write a professional report. So let me just go through some of the common ones. So firstly, the abstract. So it needs to cover the key aims and the findings. All right. So it should cover something about the results, like what you take away. When people look through journal papers and stuff, they only read the abstract initially because to see if it's worth reading that paper. That, that covers it's just a very brief summary of the whole paper. So just to say this is a report on labs one to three of module two or whatever, doesn't really give the reader any information. So make sure you cover those key aims and key findings and get the length right. So it doesn't want to be a half page massive abstract, but one line is also probably a bit short. So just a paragraph is usually typical for an abstract. Introduction, this, the most common mistake, I saw this a lot, if you look at the marking rubric, it's all about defining your aims and motivation for the work. Okay, You can choose what those aims are based on what you did and what you learned. You can structure that report to fit how you learned in the lab, but you still need to define the aims in the intro. So a lot of people wrote introductions that just described the contents of the report, So which is which kind of more, it read like the, the lab worksheet rather than actually here's the aims of what we're trying to um, show in this report. Okay. So make sure you identify the aims. If the word like aim, goal, or target isn't in the intro anywhere, then you probably haven't identified the aims. Okay, That was quite a common issue. So the discussion, most people just made this too brief. It was, there wasn't much discussion of results, and more of just like showing result after result after result and not really talking about it. So it's better to introduce a result and then say, you know, why did that occur? What does it mean? Um, if you don't know, you, you can still put, put forward some theories. Right? This is all, the discussion is your chance to really show you understand the topic. Right? And you get marks on the rubric for understanding. So use the discussion. That's really the, meant to be the most interesting part of the report. 
Um, so kind of along what I was just saying, consider kind of mixing in that discussion with the results. It's not very good for the reader to just see a page full of graphs with no like text in between it, nothing introducing um, any of the different results. It's just it's, it's a bit like much to see. And then you go for the discussion, you have to keep going back to that page and looking at the associated result. Often half those results aren't referred to anywhere in the discussion. So everything should link together nicely. And that's easier to do if you kind of combine the two. You can still add a separate discussion after your results with, with their bit of discussion. You can go into more detail afterwards. But don't just put result, 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 result. Okay, and on that note, remember it's a report, not the logbook. Okay, some of these came across pretty much just like sort of digital logbooks, right? Which lacks that in depth discussion that we're looking for. Figures should be numbered and captioned. Right? Some reports had no numbers or captions, just figure, figure, figure. It's pretty much meaningless. When you do, a lot, of, a lot of them just had numbers but no caption, and that doesn't tell you what's in the figure, of course. Even if you refer to that figure in the text, which you should do, and describe it, it's easier if you're glancing for a report if you have captions. So that's really a requirement. You'll never see a journal paper that doesn't have figure numbers and captions. Um, and if you ever want guidance on this, just read, read a few more journal papers in, in those scientific journals, and you'll get the feel for what these reports should look like, just as professional as possible. And make that caption actually explain what's in the figure. So just saying in the red here, figure one circuit is not really a good enough caption. Okay, Circuit diagram with a MOS differential pair in common input mode, that tells you exactly what you're looking at, yep. or the point you're trying to get across with that figure. Also make them clear, and that includes the data values. So can anyone tell me, can anyone even see that there's a curve on this graph? And can you tell me the voltages? <laughs> Like, this is common. This is in a lot of reports, right? Just a poor quality screenshot with the colors not optimized, the text too small. I can't even see if that's a result or not, right? Which, which is tough to mark. So whereas the right-hand side, you can see the formatting's been edited, nice and clear data, and it's still a little bit blurry, but I can read these numbers, right? If I can read the numbers, then I'm happy. Um, so yeah, just be careful. And that comes into, I can't mark results that I can't see, but also in the presentation marks. This is obviously poor presentation and on, the, um, on your right side, that's much better. Um, and try to use professional scope images. I know if you forget to bring a USB on the day, that's tricky. Um, but again, same problem. I can't see the peak-to-peak -peak value or anything on this, right? And it doesn't look as professional. Whereas here, I can actually read the values and see exactly what's going on. And it looks a lot neater, okay? Yep. It didn't work? Did you ask the tutor? Yeah. He couldn't get it to work? <laughs> okay. What we'll what we try to do, because it might be, it's probably because these tools are, uh, you know, they don't keep up with the USB trends maybe. It might be that certain format hard drives work and some don't, like FAT32, NTFC. Um, what we can try to do is make sure the tutor has a USB that does work so he can always do the transfer for you in future labs. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you don't have it, then just, just try to do your best with what you've got. Make it as professional as possible and, try, and, and clear. Because it, 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 this person had maybe cropped in. I don't know what the original quality was like, oh, right. but maybe they can still see the values. And that's, a, that's much better, because otherwise I just see that you have a, a scope image or something. Right? Um, yeah, so you're not going to lose a huge amount of marks for the scopes, because I know it's tricky with the USB. The, the figure issue here, you can edit this after the lab, so... There's really no excuses for that part. Um, all right, final page of feedback, lots of feedback. <laughs> Equations, um, just put the effort into formatting them nicely. Again, that comes into the professional side. So like use subscript when you're using the CM on VCM, things like that. Number your equations as well, and then you can talk about them in the text, but equation one, equation two. References, some people were great with this, and you don't need many for a lab report. You know, one or two is normally going to be sufficient in, in something like this, but get them right. So the example on the right, nice reference, all the information. These are genuine examples from reports. 
obviously I'm not naming anybody, but library and internet <laughs> is not a reference. <laughs> and be careful with wikis, because of course anybody can edit a wiki, that's the whole point of it. Um, so one, it could be inaccurate, but it also could change from the time you put it up. The very least you've got to do is say when you accessed it, but much better is to most wiki, a good, any good wiki uh, in a technical subject will have references in it of where that information came from, so go to that core root reference and use that if you're looking through wikis. But still, yeah, missing a lot of information. So, um, yeah, a bit more attention to the references. Again, if some people got it right, so don't think this applies to all of you. You might have done all of this correctly, but I'm just pointing out the common issues. Uh, and the writing style, use professional language wherever you can. Um, so avoid contractions. Don't join words together. Things like would have, I would have done this. Doesn't sound professional, right? Um, so just simple mistakes there. Um, also be consistent with your tense, so past or future or present. Let's get that consistent. And avoid um, first-person pronouns, okay? So I or we. I is particularly um, poor for reports. We is somewhat acceptable. Yeah, like Different lecturers might say that's fine. Others won't like it. But if you avoid them altogether, you're not going to upset anybody. There's no one that insists on we or I. Um, but if you have to use one of them, if you can't think of a better way to word it, then go with we, not I. I doesn't sound professional, and, and you did these in pairs anyway, so it um, wouldn't make sense. Uh, but especially avoid that in methods and results sections. So that's seen as quite poor form. Um, and then finally there, get a proofreader if you can, especially if English isn't your first language. I appreciate this is much harder um, to get the writing nice if, uh, if it's not your native language. But get a friend to read through it, just check it flows if you can. That all comes into time management. I, I appreciate that as well. So we never give you something like a report to write and say next day it's due. You always have you know, a week or two at least. So try to get it done earlier. Then you've got time to ask people to read it. Three pages, it's um, not that big an ask. Uh, I think the uni also, you could probably go to the library and talk to people there, and there are services to help with writing style. Oh, yeah, final comment. Stick to the page limit. So we were very clear in the guidelines, three-page limit. Nothing beyond page three is going to get marked. And still, I got quite a few coming out with four or five pages. Some had six. Right? And I just have to ignore that. So I have to say, all right, you've got no conclusions, no discussion. I can see it, but I'm not allowed to mark it because it's not fair on everyone else to put all the effort to get it into three pages. So do pay attention to that limit. At least one person told me they had a, an issue that once they uploaded it, the formatting changed a bit, and it went on to the next page in the Turnitin. So I suggest once you upload, just check your file. Like you can view it, ensure that it's still within that. If you have trouble, you can email me the original version, which is the same, but you know, format slightly different in three pages, and I'll take that. Um, seems like most people didn't have that issue. I, I don't know why it would have occurred in that case, but it's possible. Okay, so that's all of the general feedback for the report. So hopefully these will help you. These slides I'll put up later today as well, so you can go through and just maybe checklist it against your next report. You still have time. Uh, to, uh, like a lot of these are easy marks you can uh, give yourself. Okay, so on to the main topic for today. So system integration. As I said, we're going to stick mostly surface level. We're going to talk about two port networks, impedance matching, maximum power transfer, loading effect, and bandwidth. So this is all about when you make your, uh, your full systems, you maybe have your subsystems or your devices. When you bring them together, these different modules, yeah, you may need to uh, uh, optimize how you do that. right? to ensure maximum power from one subsystem to the next, to uh, avoid noise coming in when you connect those uh, together. So commonly used for any en electronics engineer, um, but not really often uh, taught much. So these slides are uh, mostly made by Binesh, actually, but he's on leave at the moment, so he can't present them. Um, they're, as I said, we'll go through them pretty quickly today, but they'll be a good reference for you to go back to. And you can just see these topics, be aware of them, and always dive in deeper if you see this problem in a lab. Maybe you see some extra noise come in when you connect two circuits, and you think, oh, you know what, that could be a ground loop. I, I heard about ground loops, and then you look into it, try out ways to fix it. So we're just essentially raising some awareness of some of these topics. So design considerations for designing more complex circuits and connecting circuits together. 
uh, and some of these only really become issues with high frequency circuits. So we haven't dealt with that too much in this course, but it's a common issue. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, won't actually be directly assessed in the exam, but it may help you with some of the smaller questions in the exam um, and just something to refer back to. It can also help with the report. I think you might even be able to explain some of your findings or some of the noise. You can at least give a good potential reasoning uh, based on some of these concepts. So two-port network. So two-port network, pretty straightforward. Just uh, two input ports, two output ports. You may recognize like differential amplifiers are uh, um, a very common uh, two-port network. Uh, you can notice here that the current, the input current is going into it, and so is the output current. That's just convention when you're looking at two-port networks. So don't worry too much about that, but it's still uh, an important thing to note so you don't uh, get your minus signs mixed up if you're ever um, sort of diving deeper into this sort of work. Okay, so as I said, common ones amplify circuits. So, of course, one of these input or output terminals could be connected to ground. It's still, still there as a terminal, so that's still a two-port network. So we can combine these two-port networks, and they can be connected in a variety of ways. Okay, so you've got your series, parallel, cascade, series parallel, and parallel series. So, any guesses as to how these two are combined? Series, yep. Series connection. So, you've got your one input, one output port shared, connected. Your voltages will add, but your currents stay the same. Okay? So, I'll get the uh, laser pointer. Oh, my slides have crashed. One second. Okay, yep, so our voltage is add, current stays the same. That's a series. What about this one? Parallel, yep. So here the currents add and the voltages stay the same. All right. So just different ways you can connect these together. And this one? Cascade, yep. So this you recognize maybe from your amplifiers, right? Differential amplifiers in particular. Um, we at least had a slide or two mentioning how you can cascade them together. So here your currents and voltages are going to be a function of the um, previous current and voltage, so depending on your um, circuit that they're passing through. So how do we find the overall parameters when we combine these systems together? So we use a system matrix approach. And yeah, there are several system matrices, and diff depending on what you're trying to solve what you want to work out. You might use one particular one, um, but they're interchangeable, so once you know one, you can find all the, other, all the others. Um, so these are summarized here. You've got the Z matrix, the Y matrix, the H matrix, A, B, C, D, and S matrix. Um, so S is quite separate. This is really just for optics and electromagnetic theory. Uh, many of you won't come across that in electronics, um, but it's something me and Binesh work with a lot more, so I guess he put that in there. Uh, just to show that it, the same uh, techniques apply um, to your EM waves as well. And, yep. So the overall system can be found by doing ma the appropriate matrix algebra on the individual mat matrices. So each, each of those sub-circuits can be characterized by a matrix. And then, depending on what you're trying to find out, you might have to add those matrices together, uh, times them together. Um, so that's, we'll, we'll go through a couple of examples today. We won't go into too much detail. So here we have 
uh, model for a two port system and its Z matrix down at the bottom. So we have our voltage terms and the relationship between the currents and uh, voltages given by this matrix. So each of these terms means something for your system. And you can tell right away your Z11, it says your input voltage divided by your input current. So that's going to give you your input impedance, right? And that you'll solve that by setting your I2 to be zero. So each of these can be, if you can measure or access those values, you can calculate the individual um, Z terms to build up your matrix. All right. So it's pretty straightforward to do if you know, if you have some access to the current and uh, voltage values there. So just a closer look at this, we can measure our output. We could set our input currents. And if we've got all that information, as you saw from the previous slide, we can calculate all of those Z terms. And that's our behavior for this subsystem of our total system. So as I mentioned, the Z11 is the input impedance. Anyone know what the Z22 will be? Output impedance, yep. Because that's your V2, your voltage at the output, and your current divided by your current at the output. And what does Z12 and Z22 represent? Any ideas? Trans impedance of the system, OK? So they're more of your internal um, parameters. And that, when it comes to amplifiers, that can represent your gain and be related to that. So now we have two systems connected in series. So the overall Z matrix is found just by, if, if they're series connected, just by adding your Z matrix for circuit A to your Z matrix for circuit B. So very simple in this case. So in this example, hopefully my pen's working. So we have a two-port system with one Z matrix connected in series with one with a different Z matrix. What are the input and output impedances of that system? So first, we'll just add the matrices to get the matrix for our total system, OK? And that's going to be quite simple. 13 plus 22, 5.1 plus 6.7i, 5.2, 6.1i, and 3.2 plus 12i. So we've got that for our total system. What's our input impedance? Anyone know just straight from looking at that? Exactly. Yep, 13 plus 22i. So Just this term here, your Z11. Yep. And the output impedance. Yep. Just that one there. Okay, so really simply just found out those parameters of our combined system just by adding those matrices. Okay? So H parameters um, are another one used. Um, for transistor models. So you can see these somewhat resemble your uh, small signal equivalents. Um, so here, H11 is equivalent to your short circuit input impedance. And that's because there we've basically set, we set to, to calculate H11, we set V2 to equal zero. Um, so that's effectively shorting V2. 
and that gets you, then you can uh, measure your V1 and I1 appropriately to get your H11. And H12 equivalent to our inverse of voltage amplica amplification with our, our current amplification and inverse of our output impedance. So just similar approach to combining your, um, your circuits, but you can do it for transistors as well. We won't go into any more detail on that because, as I said, it's not going to be assessed, but it's just something to be aware of. If you do get more complex circuits, uh, you might want to look into H parameters and how you model uh, those complex circuits. Okay, we'll move on to impedance matching. So this is a particular issue for high-frequency signals. If we connect two circuits together with a long cable and the impedance isn't matched, there's going to be a signal reflection at the termination points of that cable. Okay? So the signal, some of the signal will get reflected back at where those uh, two unmatched resistances or impedances lie, um, and that's going to cause noise in your circuit, basically. You have this um, back-and-forth signal going in your cable. And it's similar to, again, going to the optics. It's like reflection of light as it goes from one refractive index to another. You know how you get your reflectance of glass, like 4% coming off glass. That's because of that change in refractive index. If it was the exact same refractive index of air, you wouldn't see that. There'd be no reflection. It would just transmit right through. Right? And so that's what you really want in your systems. You want to remove that mismatch so your signal just goes straight through. There's no back reflection. And that's what impedance matching is used to do. So bring down, bring down that reflection to zero so all your input gets transmitted into the device. So this is achieved by making your output impedance and your input impedance equal to the characteristic impedance of the cable. Okay? When you buy cables, you can measure the characteristic imped impedance, or you can buy cables, and you, that will be defined. Uh, the amplitude of that back reflection is going to be proportional to the mismatch. So if you're close, if you're 55 ohm cable and a 50 ohm um, output impedance and input impedance, it's not going to be a big problem. If it's a 100 ohm cable, 50 ohm um, devices, then it's going to be a much bigger issue. So characteristic impedance there of your cable, just to find the ratio of the amplitudes of voltage and currents of a wave traveling in one direction, ignoring any reflections. So to give an example of this, we have this system here. You can see we have a 50 ohm input, 50 ohm output, but our characteristic impedance of the cable is 75 ohm. So that's unmatched as is. And one solution to this is to use um, L pads. Okay, so this is resistance matching L pads. Uh, a more extreme example here where we have a 500 ohm and a 50 ohm. And connected at the moment with this L pad to uh, correct for this impedance. So if you just connected them together with any with a standard cable, there'd be a massive back reflection issue because of that. Let's say you use a 50 ohm cable, you have a large step from 50 to 500. But the equivalent circuit of this, you can see in a second, will show you, uh, for, as you view it from each side, the impedance will be matched. So our 500 ohms is split there as a 475 ohm and a 56.2. Let's go to the equivalent circuit. OK. So you can see that as we're looking in this way, we're going to get the combination of the 56.2 and the 475 in parallel. And as we're looking this way, you'll get the 56.2 and the 50 in parallel, so that would just be 25 ohms, roughly, and that would be in series with your 475, so that would be 500, okay? But looking from the other way will also give you around 500, okay? Or around 50, sorry. So both, both sides are happy with that, right? From their perspectives, um, 
they're, they're matched or close, closely matched rather than 50 to 500 straight away. So yeah, take your time and uh, maybe go through that in your own time if it's not obvious straight away. Um, but yeah, that's the most probably the most common technique for matching impedances. Um, and you can buy impedance matching pads. So these are commercially available, um, and they have, they use the same design concept. So they they just connect through to ground via some resistance, um, and it will be specific for your problem. So this. This one here could be for a 50 ohm end mail to a 75 ohm um, cable, right? So it depends on what you've got. Is the ground here maybe a virtual ground? Huh? The ground? The yeah, these connectors, they have the signal pin and then a ground. the ground is the outside pin. So they'll just connect you via some resistance to that ground. Yeah. It's designed for tools with a connector that has a ground and a signal. So what it's doing is adding that extra resistance path to, to give you some sort of equivalent circuit like this, but based on whatever resistance values it's spec'd for. Right? So this is, as I mentioned, mostly an issue for high frequency. Um, not such a big deal if you're a DC or um, low frequency circuits. So if you do get into high frequency equipment, you'll need to make sure you're using the right kind of connectors as you um, connect those different systems together. Another option, impedance matching using transformers. Okay, so we have a transformer here, set a number of windings on this side, a number of windings on this side. So the resistance of the load, as seen from this primary side, will depend on this equation. So that effective resistance is your MP divided by NS squared times the actual resistance of the load um, circuit. Okay, so you can also add a transformer in and customize that. So here's a quick question. I think it's the only one in the slides today. How, what's that value of MP over NS needed? when you're connecting this audio amplifier with its internal resistance of 50 ohms um, to a headphones of an input resistance of one kilo ohm. Uh, equations come up down the bottom there as a hint. Okay, I'd be happy with that. We'll go through that just quickly. So for our maximum power transfer, we want our R internal to be equal to our R load, 
or the R load that we see from our primary circuit. So that's R E F F, R effective. So us using that equation, we just need to simply rearrange and get MP over NS is equal to 50 over 1000 square rooted. And that's equal to 0 0.224. That makes sense to everybody? Okay, so then you can choose your MP and NS to make sure you get that ratio, and you've got a nice matched circuit. So that's an alternative to the LPAD approach. And depending on your system, um, one approach might be better than the other. This one certainly is um, quite a versatile one. But you need to be able to design your transformer. So um, in your typical lab session, it's easier to make a matched resistance circuit. OK, we'll just look at maximum power transfer. So here, well, as Vinish has got the little story. So early days of electric motors, they found that to get the most efficient transfer of power from the battery to the motor, and of course that's essential if you want to um, get the most out of your battery, then the required resistance for different parts need to be matched. Okay, So you need to match your impedances. So that led to the maximum power transfer theorem. So obtain maximum power from a source of a finite resistance resistance of load must be equal to the resistance of the source viewed from its output terminals. Okay, so we have just a very simple diagram. Here you have your internal resistance and your load resistance. Important to note that if you have a complex impedance, then the matching is the complex conjugate. Okay, so you see here we have a plus J or I, and then here we have the minus J. Okay, so to get the maximum power transfer, you need to have the complex conjugate on one of them. So here's your here's a power versus impedance chart, just to demonstrate this point. So if our load impedance is much greater than our internal impedance, then the voltage is going to be high but the current's going to be very low, all right? And overall, we get not so much power out of that. If our load is much less, our current's going to be high, but our voltage is going to be quite low. So again, less power. And you can check these uh, kind of, with numbers, you can uh, check these calculations and make this kind of graph if you just use an example circuit. Whereas if we match them exactly, our voltage and current give us the optimal uh, power. So you get the maximum power to the load, okay? So to do that when we're connecting systems together, you just need to add in an impedance matching pad. So you can see here, we've got a bit of a mismatch because we have our capacitor here giving us a minus 1000, okay? And we don't have that coming out of the source, but both have got the 50 ohms, so there's a match in the actual the resistance value, but not in the complex impedance, right? So in this case, simply adding your inductor here gives you your complex conjugate, because you get the plus 1,000. And now the circuits are matched, OK? So you'll get the maximum power. So a simple addition like that can increase your uh, power throughput, you increase your efficiency of your coupling between your circuits there. Okay, we'll go on to loading effects. So this one, I think most of you will be quite familiar with loading effects. So we can think of, for example, a voltage amplifier. We think of it as a voltage source, and that however much current we draw out of that, it will remain constant. But we know that in reality, with your typical um, real voltage source, when more current is drawn by the load, the voltage of an amplifier will, can drop down right? Because power ultimately is limited. So that's the effect of loading. The simplest example is a voltage divider circuit. Okay, so you're all familiar, of course, with a simple voltage divider. 
if we look at that circuit in a bit more detail, the output of that circuit with no load connected is going to be 0.5 volts. Current drawn from that supply is going to work out to be 0.5 milliamps. But when we add a load, so in this case a 10 ohm resistor, then of course now we have resistors in parallel here and our overall output is going to decrease. So a higher current drawn from the source, but our output voltage is just 9.8 millivolts. And we get our 1 milliamp current. Okay, so the maths there is all very straightforward and simple. Um, but how do we resolve it? Because of course this can bring down the performance of your system. You might rely on that constant voltage at the output. You might need that for a variety of reasons. So it can be solved through a few different methods. Essentially, you just need to add a buffer stage. So those who did ELEC 275 will be very familiar with op amps. And one of their most basic configurations is as an input buffer. And then you're relying on these op amp characteristics, um, your infinite input impedance, your low output impedance. And your gain can be one, so you don't change your signal at all, but you've buffered that. So as you adjust your load now, it's not going to affect the voltage in, in your ideal case. Of course, in reality, you're not going to get infinite or zero output impedance. It can still have some effect, but it's going to be uh, massively minimized. And we've, uh, we've learned a lot about how to basically make op amps throughout this course. So that's just one application for them. The, another even simpler one is just an emitter follower circuit. Okay. So that also has your unity gain, or roughly unity gain, um, when set up in common collector. Okay. okay, and bandwidth considerations. So if we're combining, let's say, amplifiers, um, the bandwidth can be calculated using the ABCD matrix. We won't go into the detail of that here, but the essential thing to appreciate is that you end up, when you combine these two systems here, the result will be narrower than the first two. Okay, So the highest cutoff frequency is going to be decided by the lowest of those two individual stages, the lowest high frequency cutoff. Right? And your lowest cutoff is going to be decided by the highest of those stages. So you end up with a much narrower, narrower response. That might be a good thing. You might be trying to selectively choose a certain, uh, certain frequency for your radio. Um, but in many cases, it can be a bad thing, and you'll, you'll, you'll lose out on some signal. So design has to be applied carefully there. Um, and your slope, therefore, is going to increase. Okay? You're going to get a sharper um, frequency band response there. Okay, and the final topic, just to cover briefly, and this is a common one that does cause some issues in labs, especially with uh, those with high frequencies. So just grounding, so your common reference point between signal and power supplies. And one thing to note, there are different types of ground, and a circuit can have several grounds. You can have a signal ground and an earth ground and a chassis ground. So usually we don't worry about the ground connection much, okay? But it can become important, especially for very highly sensitive circuits um, or with many, many uh, subsystems when you're trying to connect them together. The way you connect the ground up can actually bring noise into your circuit, um, mostly through electromagnetic interference. So the main two types of grounds we have are the power ground and the signal ground, okay? It can actually be, um, you can sometimes have you can connect them together, of course, and typically we have in our labs. But you can do your whole system with a separate signal ground and a separate um, power ground if that helps your design. Sometimes people also want to separate their digital signal ground and their analog signal ground. Okay, all comes into how you um, into what you need out of that circuit. But the issue you can get is ground loops. So this is a circuit arrangement that allows, allows currents to flow, basically from ground to ground. 
So it picks up induced currents and basically causes noise in your circuit. And this can be very troublesome, especially for high-speed circuits. So in this case, this would be the ground loop here. Okay. And this mainly happens if your circuit is set up in a way where there's multiple paths to ground. All right, because some current can go one path to ground, another can go another, a different path. And it will result in some small noise, but that can be amplified depending on what your circuit's there to do. Um, so ground loops can be avoided just by taking care on how you connect up your different circuits of your system to ground. So any of these three approaches can work. You can go from one circuit to the other. Uh, in this case, this, um, this resistor is just, just representing the impedance of the wire. It's, you don't need to actually add that resistor in there. Um, and then going through to one ground point or you can have them all going through straight to one ground point. What you don't want to do is mix these approaches together, right? And you can have uh, resistors to ground, so low impedance ground reference, okay? So just something to bear in mind, if you are doing complex circuits in the lab and you do get some noise, and that's happened that Binesh knows some academics here that had this exact problem, it was just how they connected up the ground, okay? So if you take care to make sure you're um, connecting it in an appropriate system like one of these, it should eliminate that problem. Okay, that's all of the high level content today. Um, just gonna go over the upcoming assessment. Remote lab, this Friday. So hopefully you've all finished. Who's finished? Nobody? Oh, one person, all right. <laughs> hopefully you've all nearly finished, all right. It's gonna be really interesting to mark this because we, we see every click you do. We've got these big sheets of every, everyone's name and all the clicks, what time they used it. Um, of course, we can we're anonymize those statistics, but we're gonna look into that and see um, how students work on these sort of labs. But one thing to note on that, it is a lot of my deadlines I set at midnight. I think Binish has set this for 5 p.m., okay? So submit your worksheet before five on Friday. Not, don't wait till midnight. Um, lab report two, submission deadline 27th. So that's coming up pretty quick. And the big news is the mini exam in next week's lecture, okay? So that's gonna be a one hour exam. It's the same style and format of the final exam. What we're trying to do is prepare you for that final exam so you're not surprised by anything and ultimately save you some time on exam day because you're gonna know the, the structure of the questions. But the final exam is gonna be two hours, this is one hour. So in each, you're gonna have the four categories, basically what your four assignments have been on, right? Uh, and the power amplifier assignment will be next, I'll get to that. Um, but in each category you'll have you know, two or three questions, a couple of easy ones and one like tricky-ish one in this exam. In the final exam, there'll be more questions in each category, okay, because it's two hours, so you've got more time. Uh, they might be a little bit harder in the final exam, but they're all gonna be about the level of your assignment questions, all right? There's not gonna be some big, nasty, out of nowhere question that we've never shown in a slide or put on the assignment, right? Some might just need a little bit of thinking about. Uh, the big thing is only you only need to answer three of the four categories, all right? So that frees up some of your time. Um, choose, look through the questions, choose the three you wanna do, the topics you know best or the questions you think you'll do best on um, and answer those three, okay? Uh, so that's just use your hour to really do that. Please arrive at that lecture by 1.15. Does anyone think they, they can't make that? It's, what time can you make? 120. Okay, well, I'm going to say 115, <laughs> but realistically, we're going to wait till 120, 125. But I, wanna, I don't want people rolling in at 125 because we want to start you all off at the same time. It's going to be the first time this room will be busy because this is a assessed uh, in class test. It's going to be here, yeah. So, what we do is we hand out the exam paper. You have a separate answer book, and it will be exam conditions, one hour. Um, where you just solve it. Um, once you're done, you can leave and, and you hand in the paper, okay? So it's closed book, it's no laptops, no phones. Just basically the same as your final exam, but shorter, right? Part of the reason for this is that ELEC 275, we found the students did great on the assignments, great on the labs, really struggled with the exam, right? It seemed like a big shock. And one part of that is maybe they're not used to that condition for these topics of having no Google, no internet, no book to flick through. 
So we're trying to make sure, trying to give you that shock to make you realize, all right, this is what it's going to be like, because we don't want you all to do terrible on the exam, all right? So some people failed last year that we were amazed, like we thought there's no way they should fail this, but they just weren't ready for the exam, I guess. So we're trying to better prepare you for exam conditions, okay? Yeah, so there's four categories. Yeah, the four, the four that, like the topics of the assignments, yeah, and the labs. Um, and you can just choose three. So look through them all at the beginning. And, okay, maybe you think you really don't like differential amplifiers. You can ignore that one. All right, just do the other three. Maybe do the same for the uh, final exam. Same for the final exam. Yep, that's why that's only two hours. Instead of, like, for, like, 275, we have three hours. Uh, and you answer everything. So here uh, we've given you that option of kind of eliminating one. I suggest you revise all of it because you might think, Okay, I won't, I won't study this at all, but that might turn out to be the much easier question and you, you could regret it. But yeah, up to you how you handle that. Um, assignment four will be delayed because that was going to coincide with some other deadlines and we've already had a few de delays pushing things back. So that should be on ILAM by the end of the week and I'll confirm the submission date later, um, but it won't be any sooner than the 3rd of November, so you'll have a bit of time to do that. Might be pushed back a bit beyond that. And the final exam, I don't know if you have this information yet, but that's the date that will be the 25th of November, okay, at 10 a.m., so two-hour duration. So I think this is all you've got left for assessment, right, for this unit. So the end is in sight, yeah. Can you, like, eliminate the Edison caps off, like, this is, like, 1.30? Well... It may start at 1.30. I need to speak to Binesh because we need to plan it. But before we do the exam, we're going to be doing the TED surveys as well and, give, and showing a few slides. So, yeah, if, no, if, if lots of people can't make it to 1.30, if there's a genuine conflict, we'll push it back to 1.30. Yeah. Um, but this is the only in-class test we give you, so we just have to ask everyone does turn up. And, um, yeah, maybe you have to rush or miss the end of another lecture or something, but... It's, it's probably worth it for, for the exam. Yeah. So what's... And you're at Waterloo Road? Yeah. What are you there for? What's the module? Okay. Is there any chance I let you... Can you leave that 10 minutes earlier? Okay. When does that class end? At 1? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm going to suggest 1.15 to get here. I'll try. I won't start the exam till half 1. and Because I do that walk a lot. You can walk it in half an hour easily. Okay? So that means that everyone, even if you miss the bus or it's full, you should be able to walk it. Yeah? Um, so try to be here as early as possible because it, it's just going to be chaos if we're st people are still coming in once we've tried to set the time. Okay? Um, but, yeah, half 1 should be fine. Okay. All right. Yes. Are they are they already on island? I don't know if Finnish has put them up. They'll be up beforehand. Yeah. So I'll check that today. It will be the same formula sheet for the exam and the mini exam. Okay. So, but as I said, that's not going to be a guide to the questions. Like that's just the formulas you're given. So learn the other ones.